Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Gray Ferris here at the Ruth Bay Sea and Science Center, and I have the privilege this afternoon of spending some time with Mr. Nathaniel S. S. Wilson here in East Booth Bay. Uh, Mr. Wilson is a master sailmaker and specializes in sails for traditional vessels. All right, so let's get started. So, Zuriel Smith would like to know, how did you start your career as a sailmaker? I didn't start out with the notion that I was going to be a sailmaker at all. It was, uh, I entered the service because of a draft in 1969 and joined the Coast Guard. And through a set of circumstances uh, out of my control, I was ordered to report to the Coast Guard Academy sail off to be the helper to, to work with uh, Vern Vernot, who was a civilian employee to maintain the sails for the, for the Coast Guard Academy sailing fleet. And I walked into this big 80 foot long room with French windows, hardwood floor, all this space, and nice music. I said, I'm not going to leave here. There's my <laughs> in the service. So that's how I got started. Okay. And, um... Bartlett Lockwood would like to know, what does it mean to be a master sailmaker? Well, I think it means that you have good, good knowledge of your trade. Because I didn't go through any formal training process, there isn't one in this country, but, um, and I don't, I don't know when I got given that title, but it, uh, certainly at my age I guess it fits. So. <laughs> and how did you end up in East Booth Bay? My family has been coming here uh, to the Booth Bay region for since the 18, mid 1890s, so several generations, and we came here summers, and it seemed like a good fit when I got out of the service in a short time at Mystic Seaport to start my own business and moved here. And that was, that was uh, 40, I've been here at this shop for 40 years. Five years earlier, I was in Southport. I've been in the trade for 50 years next, next February, I guess. Wow, yeah. congratulations. Elijah Smith would like to know what types of cloth material are used to make sails? Sail design is all driven by cloth technology. Cloth comes first, and so that determines a lot of, a lot of the practice in building a sail. We use um, polyester, primary for the types of sails we build, we use polyester, it's a synthetic cloth. We use nylon, which for light sails. There's, you know, there's Kevlar and Mylar and carbon fiber sail cloth. Um, we don't work in that area, that's another whole type of sail construction. And then, of course, then there's the cotton. This was the uh, this has probably been used for sales longer than any of the new, any of the polyester sales. So this dates from so the uh, 1930s, so, and still makes very nice sales. A whole different type of technology. Bartlett Lockwood would also like to know: um, Do you work alone, or do you have people who help you for making sales? I started out when I began my business to work alone. As the business grew, I had. I've had as many as seven employees, and I normally have three. Three is a good number in the shop. Okay, and what are some of the tools that you use when you are making sales? Well, I think we would have to go over and look at one of the benches over here. Terms, Sherm can demonstrate some of them here. Mm -hmm. uh, the hand tools is a simple palm, leather device you put on your hand for doing, pushing the needle through the cloth for the hand work. A range of sail needles. There are special needles for the, for the thread, heavy thread. Um, there are skids for splicing a rope. And of course, the sewing machine for seaming the sails. We have six machines up here, all set up for different size thread and different weights of sail, different types of sail cloth. All right, so right now I'm roping the leech of the jib topsail for the schooner Pride of Baltimore. This just entails stitching the bolt rope onto the sail, and it's made up of a three-part cord. So there's three different uh, thread, threads in here. You're on different edges of the sail, you do it in different ways so that you have more attention on one edge than you on the other. 
slow each, so this is like this is the edge with the least amount of tension. And this is a soundmaker's palm and a number ten needle. You don't want to pull it too tight, just snug. And you have to do every lay of the rope, all the way around the sail. Okay. Nat McKenna would like to know, what is the most complicated sail that you've ever made, and what sort of a boat was it for? Or which boat was it for? Well, there's been a few. I've tried to which one is be the most technical sail to build was uh, the I think the mainsail for the New York 50 Spartan, just, it's just 2,000 square feet. It's a sail that measurements, adjustments to the sail were made in fractions of an inch. It had to be technically correct from a design perspective for a sail from the offset, with minor changes in time, but that probably required the most um, accurate measuring and, and, and design. Mathematics in that was very, very close to, you know, a lot of decimal points. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Zur Zuri Smith would like to know, what is the largest sail that you have ever constructed? I'd say by far the largest sail was the fact it just left here this week. It's been in that corner all winter. Uh, the uh, square top for the Constitution, the main, main square top. For a matter of scale, it's the foot is the length of a ball, basketball court. Wow. And the hoist is the same as the width of a basketball court. Wow. So it's 50 feet in the hoist and then 90 feet on the foot. Uh, how long did it take to, to complete that project? It seemed like forever. <laughs> um, actually, we made it in a month. Two people primarily working on it. And then I had crews of people from the carpenter's boat shop. Students come in to help sew the 460 some odd hand sewn rings in the sail, make the reef points and do all the, that type of work. I have crew come in for a couple of days each week, different crews, over the span of about four to five weeks built in. I remember once you mentioned a story about lofting or sewing a sail in um, the gymnasium. Well, we lofted that sail in the, in the basketball, in, in the gym at the high school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bartlett Lockwood would like to know, you make sails, but have you ever built a boat? I have never built a boat. <laughs> But I painted a lot of boats. Painted a lot of boats. <laughs> Great. Um, I have a question for you. How has technology changed um, the way that you work? Technology and sailmaking has gone digital, very digital, digital design, um, cutting, and you know a lot of components of the manufacturing of the sail. Um, it's not sailmaking in the traditional sense. I still still draft plans with a you know, drafting pencil and curves and straight edges and design parameters that are all set on percentages of cord, all that sort of thing, where it would all be done by a computer and then cut by a laser and assembled, putting pieces together by number, so to speak. Mm -hmm. A lot of sails today are glued together with very strong double-sided tape, so there's very, even no stitching. So we're still, I still maintain the practice that I started, when I, when I started there was no traditional sailmaking, it was all sailmaking. I was doing what all the sail, a lot of sailmakers were doing at the time in 19, 1971. Um, demand for sails and, and the design, new cloth, new, this really is new sailcloth demanded a different way of making them. Mm -hmm. So that, then that became very, you could digitize that. And, and production was also sent offshore. A lot of the shops like this one, this size shop in 1971, would probably have been bought out or sold off um, for a franchise of a larger loft. How many lofts that are doing this traditional method of sail making still exist, either in the United States or in the, in the world? It's, they're on the comeback uh, because I think there's a new more of a demand for a sale of this type. And also, that is coming with the fact that there are a lot of, because of the Wooden Boat Magazine and Classic Boat Magazine and the Classics in Europe, 
there's a demand for sales to represent that period in the history of the boat. So mm -hmm. there's a, a very good, worldwide there's a very large number. Europe has quite a lot, France, Brittany, mm -hmm. UK. In this country there's at least three in the state of Maine. There's a couple in Massachusetts that I know of on the west coast. There's a few important towns in the area. Mm -hmm. VSSC instructor Alicia would like to know what is the current project that you're working on in, in, in your loft? Well, the primary projects right now are for Pride of Baltimore. There's, there's a jib topsail here that we're grouping on. So this pile up over there is a square top, which is this sail here. The jib top is this sail here. And we have to cut the gaff topsail. Um, I built sales, I've been building sales for Pride of Baltimore since she was launched, before she was launched, 1979, uh, 1988. So we've been over 30 years building her sales. And then this is a, a club, like 110% Genoa for an Eldridge McGinnis sloop, 28 foot sloop. And we have a set of sales over there for us teapot, teapots and oh, Okay. So we got a we have a variety of sales going on all the time. Uh, each person each person Jose's not here today, but he works that's this is his project and Sean's working on the pride. We cross over to for help each other. Do you have any advice for a young person who's interested in, in sales? And maybe you might want to pursue that as a as a career. The only um, place you're going to get training is in a loft. You can friend a sailmaker that you area where you, where you live or near where you live because you want to learn. Uh, you really want to learn by doing. I've trained a lot of people to, to do the trade. Some have stayed in the trade and some have left it. Some have taken the skills on to other, other things. Um, there's a, a bosun school I think, at the, in Canada up in Lunenburg with the Picton Castle. And they teach sailmaking some up there. There's a, I think there's a sailmaking school in Denmark. It's a two-year program, right, Sean? And for, I think a year doing traditional sails and a year doing modern sail design. And if, I think if you're really serious about it, finding that type of program where you can get your training and you know be a good. Get, if you get into Denmark to do it, that would sound like a really good program. Okay. Uh, another BSSC instructor, Anna Saroy, uh, would like to know, what did you do before making sales? Did you have a job before? Um, I was a college sales? student, and I graduated in 1969. July of that year, I received my draft notice. Mm -hmm. So I went to Portland and signed up for the Coast Guard, and they said, we have two openings in October. Do you want one of them? I said, yes. That was it for the year. Mm -hmm. So I got one of them and uh, swore in the So I was, but I've, I was a college, my college I studied fine art, mm -hmm. graphics, photography, and a painting major. I wanted to get into you know, design, mm -hmm. graphic design. So if you had not gone the, the roots of sail making, do you think you would have been an artist? Or? Probably would have gone into probably the photography because I had. Many cases of really nice cameras. Mm -hmm. None of them are any good anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I would have, I think, gone into photography. Yeah. So I have one last question, and that is from uh, BSSC instructor Adam Saroy. He was captivated by the story of the Sheila Yates, mm -hmm. um, the ship which became trapped in ice off the coast of Greenland, and which you were on. Mm -hmm. And Adam would like to know. What sort of thoughts were going through your head during such an intense situation? Mostly, I, the only thing I remember is incredibly tightness to your chest. But um, beyond that, every, just being calm and cool, and everybody was the same way, that you just you take it one moment at a time, and then continuing to look for options that you when, when things weren't, you couldn't get information or contact, you just kept looking for another way to communicate. And 
at work because we finally did reach somebody to help us. So that was. There's no explaining any of it. So. Thank you. It's a fascinating story, and we will provide a link so that people can can learn more about this uh, very interesting ship. Okay, well, I think that pretty much concludes our questions. Okay. Let's, let's take a look around the sail lot. Well, we have a floor here that is a 110% Genoa. It's a head salt, so it's a type of jib. Uh, it's in the second stage of construction. Uh, first phase, we would have drafted the sail on the floor with chalk lines and markers and cut the panels, laid them out to fit the sail design. And then the sail is, panels are taken to the sewing machine and seamed, seamed up into one, big, to one piece. So the sail is not one piece of cloth. It's made up of the numbers of panels. These are 26 inch wide panels. And then you take that, and if you look down the edges, all the edges are shaped. They're, they've got a hollow, they've got an S shape, they've got a fair curve. All those the shapes are what give it the aerodynamic power. It's, it gives, it makes it into a sail as opposed to a flat piece of cloth. So there's all the edges have some type of shape to them. It's also what they call broad seaming, which is tightening or slackening of seams to place the shape in the sail. You can see the slack in the middle of the sail. So when, it, when you tension the edges, they pull straight. And then you get a curve, you get a chord shape of the sail to this to down the aerodynamic shape. So the reinforcing patches go on in the corners, and then the next phase is the edges of having a taped edge or tabling to finish it off. One of the spring corners here this is the hardware which we, we have made for us. This is a very old type is called a Pringle. It's a very old style of construction, but it's indestructible. Yeah. The final stage is the bench work, which we would take the sail to on all the benches, put the rings in the corners and the wire in the luff or the rope in the luff, and attach the jib hanks for the, for the stay, and then the sail would be finished. So really there's four phases to the construction. We built a number of your turnabout sails, very similar uh, method, all the same methods that we just described here to build those. But we're building multiple, so we just make multiple parts to make them all identical. You know, there is no testing, and, and just hopefully no phone call. So, <laughs> that's probably the hardest part of the business is to send something out the door and know that we have we, we have checks and balances throughout the process to make sure we didn't transpose a number or misread a number on a plan. I call those my, my F-250 pickup trucks. <laughs> yeah. There's one over there and one over there. Yeah. They're, they're a handmade machine in Australia by John Cordes, just for the sail making world. So they're rare. You can't, if you want one now, you can probably wait a year. Might get it. It's powered by compressed air instead of electricity? It's got, yeah, it's got pneumatic, uh, it's all the like the needle pressure, the pressure, pressure foot pressure, the puller is all pneumatic, and then it's mechanical in terms of the stitching part, and the computer drives with just the details of the, which size. It's a, it's a game changer because it can do anything. No, there's no limit to what it can. There's nothing to fix. Or to oil. We couldn't have done some of the projects in the last 15 years without that machine. That weighs about a thousand pounds right there. And really, sails and lofts in the 19th century were huge. The lofts were small. And yet they cut their sails the way a computer today cuts a modern sail. Except they did it on a table. With, they cut by gore. They got the angle was, they cut the angle, and how many feet it was to the next floor. And then they subtract from that the gore and cut another panel, or add the gore, depending on where they're cutting it, and just know how many panels they have to do that to. That's how big sails were built in the, in the loss. They cut what they call cutting by gore. Okay. We did it up here on a couple of big sails, big single loss spinnakers we couldn't cut here, so we just cut them by draft. 
Can any of these sign machines run off computers? Or? This machine has a computer just for the programming the stitch and the, when it's up and down, you know, where the needle is. Do you use CADs to design sales? If you're going to do that, then you've got to get a, you've got to get a laser cutter. Yeah. You're, to, you're not going to have a floor anymore. Yeah. Cut your sales, sales on a table. It'll be a whole different, you're talking about $100,000 worth of investment. You're changing all the technology. It's going to tell you exactly what kind of cloth you can use and what kind you can't use. So we couldn't do some of our single enough spinners. We couldn't cut here. So we just cut them by grab. What makes it a right and left? I'm sorry, you just have to. Where you, the tools would be, a right handed person would have that, the, the rack of tools on the right side. Oh, okay. It makes no difference as far as doing the work. But if you're hand seaming, you need to have, there's a hook you have to use to hold the cloth. And that would be on the side of the end of the bench that has. Tools. Well, this bench, I put a ring there okay. for the hook to hold the cloth. We've had several hand sewing projects up here over the years. We did the Mayflower too. We did an authentic flax set of sails, 5,000 square feet of hand sewn flax with hemp ropes back in '83, I think. It took us about three months. Uh, Charles W. Morgan, the way it show we hand sewed some of her sails. It's a pretty comfortable bench. And a lot, of, a lot of use over the years.